I think the, the Fed will not listen to any good advice and will take its decision with all its options open. There is zero economic reason for the Fed to hike rates right now. The main reason is the market volatility, including the VIX index. Move up in rates will signal, if they do it, that the, jo the jobs are getting better, the economy is stronger. Monetary uh, policy normalization, so to speak, could affect adversely uh, emerging economy and so on. I don't think so. The fact that uh, the Federal Reserve will raise interest rates reflect robust, strong economic recovery in the U.S. The markets may respond in a very nervous way and then, generally speaking, through an increased global turbulence that may affect the Russian economy as well. Don't do it when the world is in turmoil mm -hmm. because it's, it's a long anticipated event. It has to happen sometime. Everybody knows it has to happen, but pick your time. From central bank governors to investors across the world, everyone awaiting with a bated breath as the U.S. Federal Reserve needs to decide on a possible rate hike. Will the Fed increase rates for the first time since 2006? That's our stock story tonight. Good evening, I'm Nantara Rai. Good evening, I'm Surabhi Upadhyay in the Mumbai studios. Let's run you through all the top stories this evening. Will she, won't she, the U.S. Fed kicks off its two-day meeting. A CNBC survey shows that 49% of market participants expect Yellen to hike rates for the first time in nine years. Wall Street extends gains as investors have their eyes fixed on Capitol Hill. Crude prices rally over 5%. Bulls power ahead on the Wall Street. The Sensex rallies 250 points. Mid caps, however, tumble in trade. In a bit to further financial inclusion, the RBI grants small bank licenses to 10 out of 72 applicants. No listed company is among the winners. It's a homecoming of sorts for Intellinet India. Private equity giant Blackstone repurchases the Indian BPO arm for 250 million pounds. And that's just four years after it sold it to Serco. After Mumbai, mm. which is obviously the financial capital of India, mm. Kolkata is going to someday pit Mumbai. Sky is the limit for West Bengal's finance minister, Amit Mitra, claims 87,000 crore rupees have come into the state after the Trinamool government took charge, says the work culture in Bengal has changed and there have been no strikes in the last one year. We will continue with that discipline and uh, of course we will look at what the new regulation says and does and you know we've always been compliant, we will continue to be compliant. We will not react to competitors cutting rates, says Axis Bank's Shikha Sharma warns of volatility in banks calculating base rates using the marginal cost of funds. Also believes RBI has room to ease rates this fiscal. Major relief for Sahara Group in the United States. A New York court dismisses a case filed by JTS Trading seeking to attach the company's hotels. Sahara is now free to sell hotels as it deems fit. Mobile advertising company Inmobi mounts a challenge to Google and Facebook joins hands with China's Apis, which is one of the biggest Android user systems. Ace investor Vinod Khosla bets big on digital money. Novo Pay Solutions launches a mobile wallet. On an inside Kolkata special, top industrialists of the city speak about the need to position brand bingo to compete with other states for investments. We take inside Kolkata in just a bit, but first up, our top story tonight. In a bit to further financial inclusion, the RBI has handed out in principle approvals for 10 players to start a small bank. This is out of the 72 applicants that were in the fray. We should point out, no listed company has managed to bag a license. Lata Venkateshna joining us with that story. Lata, you know, who are the winners and what is this going to mean for the banking industry? Well, uh, the, most of the winners have been microfinance companies, uh, except I guess one or maybe two. All financiers uh, from Jaipur is an NBFC, which gives a lot of tractor loans and SME loans. 
uh, uh, the capital local area bank Jalandhar also probably gives slightly larger loans but the remaining eight are all clearly microfinance companies we spoke to six of the remaining eight and all of them had a ticket size of uh, 12,000 to 18,000 per loan so clearly microfinance companies now uh, that may not have been the only aim of the reserve bank though uh, reaching out to unbanked areas was one very important criteria uh, uh, criterion. The others was the ability to find the initial capital, the status of their ownership, uh, whether there was too much of foreign ownership, uh, as well uh, the other things, financial soundness, proposed business plan, the fit and proper status. I guess a lot of NBFC companies, uh, or at least some of them, would have, uh, you know, some uh, perhaps reports from other regulators, probably investigative agencies, probably tax agencies for, uh, uh, you know, not for having flouted some rule or the other. And uh, the, uh, an important factor, according to the Reserve Bank press release, is their ability to reach into unbanked areas and serve underserved and unserved sections of the population. So uh, clearly, that is where all the uh, mi uh, microfinance companies are probably qualified. Uh, well, uh, uh, we, I think, have uh, one of the um, uh, winners joining us. Uh, we are being joined by Sanjay Agarwal, the Managing Director of uh, O Financiers. Uh, Mr. Agarwal, uh, good evening to you. Yeah. Uh, uh, can you tell us a little about yourself? Yeah, just AU Financiers. AU Financiers, I'm sorry. Right. Uh, yeah, okay, okay. Uh, AU Financiers, uh, yeah. what is your main line of uh, uh, businesses? What is the total loan outstanding and uh, average loan ticket size? So, ma'am, uh, thank you so much. And first of all, thank you so much to RBI and, you know, Ministry of Finance for, you know, allowing us to become a bank. And, you know, we are a Jaipur-based headquarter in BFC. It's a 20-year-old company. Our asset under management as of today is around 7,000 crores mm -hmm. and with uh, 3 lakh customers. Mm -hmm. We primarily deal into productive assets. So we financing, we do financing to vehicle, home loans, small businesses. Mm -hmm. So my 90% assets are under 25 lakhs. Okay. So I think which uh, actually, uh, you know, complies the what RBI requires from okay. this market. Okay. 50% uh, branches are into ruler and semi urban. Okay. So you will not have a problem complying with priority sector. You will already be. Uh, 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 no. Yes. Yes. So our actually 40% assets, uh, which are not on balance sheet, we actually are sourcing for the banks for their priority sector and agri requirement. Okay. So I think their 75% compliance in, in terms of priority sector lending, we are way ahead. We are around 90%. Yeah, you have to give some 18% to farmers or farm agri loans. So that, that, that won't be a challenge. So that is also around 26% to us okay. in present book. All right. Who are the yeah. owners? Are you one of the promoters? So actually I and, you know, me and Uttam, you know, our ED who promoted this company, you know, way back 20 years back. Mm. But now I think we have Wabba Pinkers, World Bank, Motilal, mm. Kedara and Chris as our investors. Okay. You, but you will, promoters have 40%? That is the requirement? No, no. In terms of conversion, RBI is still an LOI to be getting us from RBI. Yes. So, but I think we are around 34%. Mm. But RBI in their initial uh, application was looking for at least 26% in mm. case of conversion. Okay. So, I, I hope so. That will be okay for us. Okay. So, you uh, will be a holding company and you will create an entity no. which will be a bank or you will become no, a bank? No, no. We'll, we'll just convert this. Uh, we have a very simple structure. Okay. So, we'll cut, convert AU Financial into AU okay. Small Finance Bank. Okay. And what advantage will you get by becoming a bank? You get cheaper finance so because you can have uh, deposits? Ma'am, I think uh, it's uh, way beyond deposit because, in my opinion, in the next uh, first five years, our cost of fund will go up. Mm. Because to raise capital or raise a fund from retail depositor is not so easy, mm. right? But I think uh, if you want to work into financial segment, you need a, a prime, you know, license, which is bank. So mm. bank is trust. And the market which RBI is looking to, you know, uh, expand or really into the penetrate, we need some good agencies, a good brand name, mm. a good trusted name to work upon. So I think for me, it's not a liability, it's more of an asset. Okay, I can imagine. What is your, your, you will have to raise more capital therefore in the coming, uh, before uh, the 18 months? Yeah, so I think with the, the calculation will be on because uh, we were not sure we will get the license. So mm. as per the plan, yes, uh, in the year two, we want uh, more capital. But uh, we have to go back to our drawing board and see what is needed and what, how you, can we do that. You will start in 18 months or even before? No, so I think we have to do some kind of regulatory, you know, compliance. So I think... 
It may take 12 to 18 months. All oh, right. We'll leave it at that, Mr. Agarwal. Uh, all the very best to you in your uh, new venture. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Right. Take care. Over to you, uh, Surbi. Right, Tata, thank you so much for that. Well, that was one of the winners. Here are several others that we spoke to through the course of the evening. We operate from Varanasi. I mean, basically, our main area of operations is Eastern UP and Western Bihar, in fact. Eastern UP and Bihar. I mean, one of the, in can say, excluded area yes. from financial inclusion angle or from overall financial services angle. Mm -hmm. And we are a six years old company. We are in eight or nine, uh, in fact, eight states uh, across, but main stay remains in UP and Bihar. First of all, we have to convert to a bank and stabilize as a bank. Mm. So I think the next uh, three years almost is going to take us uh, in that process. And then, obviously, we can scale up much faster. We operate in 19 states. We are about 5,500 crores or so of assets. Mm -hmm. And we have been, we are primarily an urban player. Mm -hmm. And we operate in about 190 cities. So Ramesh is the promoter and chairman. We are in excess of over a thousand crores. Like Lata was pointing out, this turned out to be a revolutionary step for India's banking industry. On to global shows now. Will Fair Chairperson Janet Yellen wield the knife tomorrow? That's the big question on the mind of every investor across the world. The U.S. Central Bank will gather for its two-day meeting. Later tonight, a CNBC survey shows 49% of the market participants expect Yellen to actually hike rates for the first time since 2006. Like we've been telling you here on CNBC TV 18, the, you know, it couldn't be more fractured. It's almost as if half believe there will be a status quo policy while the other half are convinced we will see a rate action. Here's Steve Leesman with the exclusive CNBC survey. Big news in our CNBC Fed survey. For the first time in the five years we've been doing this, respondents see a rate hike in the month of the survey. Here are the numbers. 49% of plurality say, yes, the Federal Reserve will announce a rate hike tomorrow. That's unchanged from the August survey. And 43% say no. That is down with most of that showing up in the they're not sure or, or, or they don't know. Let's take a look at the timeline. You'll see a little bit of a difference here. First, we're going to look at the prior. Remember, in the midst of all the market turmoil, the fears about China, they had pushed it ahead that first rate hike to January. Now it's dialed back to, it says here November, and that's the average. The median, however, a solid September, with 26 uh, saying that, that they're going to hike rates. And you see the whole timeline's been pushed back or pushed, pushed earlier here. The balance sheet declined. September 2016 now is seen in August 2016. Over my shoulder, when will the Fed stop hiking rates? It had been all the way in the third quarter of 2018 been brought back, although you can see it's been brought shallower down to 2.69 as the terminal or the final rate. So if you take a wide view of the whole thing, the whole timeline as markets have settled down has been pushed earlier for Wall Street and as far as the Federal Reserve is concerned. Take a look at the, at the uh, path of the funds rate. We started here back in August 2014 when we first started asking about the year. 0.89% would be the, the end for 2015 and 2% for 2016, and now look where we are now. We've, we've dialed back about a whole percentage point for 2016 and about 50 or 60 basis points for 2015. So still seen very low, but beginning tomorrow. Stu Hoffman, PNC Financial Services, writes in in response to the survey, it is time for the FOMC to start bringing monetary policy slowly out of its self-induced coma in response to much improved vital signs for the U.S. economy. David Kotak writes in, this is a long drum roll. It's time to take the shot and get away from zero. Scott Wren, a little bit later, says, Wells Far from Wells Fargo Investment says, for the sake of credibility, we think one hike is in the cards this year, likely in December. So September, October, December. Question is, will there be a rate hike tomorrow or not? Well, opinion is deeply divided, to say the least. Here are some big guns on Wall Street with what investors can expect. They sort of push themselves into something where they have to do a little bit something here. But I would not be terribly aggressive if I were in that position. The Fed's been some way irresponsible. There is harm. They're destroying, they're destroying savers. That's no reason to introduce extra uncertainty. So on all the things that the Fed's supposed to care about, this isn't the time to be moving. The big question is not whether they're going to hike or not. The big question is why are we so obsessing with a single hike. Whatever it is will be, according to my knowledge, fully in line with what they are aiming at, which is to 
the anchor of stability, I think the market is more prepared for this increase than many, many traders believe it is. The Fed's decision becomes a bit trickier, and I would argue that's the one governor on the Fed's being able to move, is you can't drive the dollar too high. I must admit, I'm a little bit uh, baffled by the fact that a 25 basis point move on the part of the Fed is going to have a major effect on economic activity across the globe. People were fussing about the Fed, this with the Fed, that with the Fed, that with the Fed. And you can catch all the Fed action, all of the analysis live right here on CNBC TV 18. The special coverage starts 6.30 p.m. onwards. And ahead of the Fed decision, we should tell you that crude prices are rallying. They're up by almost 5%. And not just because the U.S. Fed is likely to take a decision tomorrow on a rate hike, but also because the, Inter uh, the uh, International Energy Agency has come out with a report saying the U.S. inventories have dropped by 2 million barrels. In reaction to all of those developments, you have Brent crude inching back towards $50 a barrel. It's up, like I said, almost by 5%. NYMEX crude doing even better trying to breach that $47 barrel mark as we speak at the moment. And as a result of that, you've seen energy stocks rising by over 2%. And you see there for the Dow Jones, it was up by almost 100 points, currently up by 83 points. Uh, we had seen uh, the Dow being led mainly on account of stocks like Chevron and ExxonMobil. Uh, so it's the sea of green as we speak in the U.S., thanks mainly to the energy stocks. The European markets, they open higher today. Once again, ahead of the two-day Fed meet. Uh, so let's bring up the frontline indices for you in Europe. British FTSE up by 91 points. The German DAX also up by about 40 points. And the French CAC having a great day in trade up by 1.67%. And should be, I have to say, a similar story played out in Asia. Oh, absolutely, Nantara. The rally really began with Asia, with all the major indices in the region rallying quite smartly. Be it the Shanghai Composite, which gained close to 5%, or the Nikkei, which gained close to a percent in trade. All of those markets ended the day with some very sharp gains as investors were awaiting the outcome of that all-important FOMC meeting. Back home, bulls are a picture of optimism as well, ahead of that crucial rate announcement by the U.S. Federal Reserve. Blue chips rallied quite sharply today, but volumes did remain thin, so that was a bit of a dampener. The Nifty gained 70 points and is now just a whisker away from the 7,900 mark. The Sensex surged over 250 points to move closer to the 26,000 level. Midcaps, however, were trading quite uh, weak and they were on a different planet altogether, coming under pressure with that particular index down about 90 points in trade. Moving on to some other action, it's a private equity giant Blackstone's largest investment in the Indian IT sector till date. In a dramatic twist, the PE giant has bought back a part of Intellinet BPO business that it itself had sold out to UK-based Circo three years ago. Kritika Saxena explains the rationale behind this pot boiler of a deal. History has a way of repeating itself. BPO firm Intellinet is back with Blackstone, having sold the company for £385 million in 2011. The private equity major has now bought it back for £250 million. Here's the background behind the dramatic buyout. In 2007, Blackstone bought over BPO player Intellinet from HDFC and Barclays. Four years later, the PE giant sold the firm to UK-based BPO service provider Serco for £385 million. The deal is expected to be wrapped up by December 2015, but Blackstone is buying back only a part of the business it sold. When Intellinet had first been sold to Serco, the deal comprised both the public and private onshore and offshore business of Intellinet. Last year, however, Serco decided to focus only on the UK government public business and sell off the private offshore BP operations. That is the business being bought over by Blackstone now. The offshore entity bought by Blackstone has 51,000 employees across 67 centres in eight countries. 70% of the business is international offshore BPO and 30% is domestic. The offshore BP operations are expected to generate revenue of approximately £235 million this calendar year with an EBITDA of approximately £35 million and a trading profit of £23 million. Blackstone intends to resurrect the Intellinet brand and rename the business Intellinet Global Services. The private equity giant is confident that BPO business will reach critical scale in the coming years. In Mumbai, Kritika Saxena. And now you know why Blackstone's gone ahead and bought back that business. Well, now, inside Kolkata, special West Bengal is one state that's never been looked upon 
as a major investment hub. And the fact that the present Chief Minister Mamata Banerjee had led the opposition against the Tata Motors proposed Nana plant in Shingur still not forgotten. So with the state coming in at the 11th position on the World Bank DIPP rank of ease of doing business, not too many questions were raised. But the state's finance minister, Amit Mitra, is not convinced about the methodology. Speaking to CNBC TV agent Shireen Bhan as part of our Inside Kolkata series, Amit Mitra says West Bengal has managed to attract more than 80,000 crore rupees over the last four years. Growth in infrastructure, uh, it's phenomenal, so I have to read you the exact number. Huh. So, take for example state plan expenditure, which goes into various forms of things that the industry uses. Hmm. That has grown by 311% in the last four years, which is a record of sorts. More interesting is that uh, capital expenditure, That's right. from where you have roads, bridges, etc., etc., that has gone by gone up by 601 percent. Mm. To, to give the exact figure, 2,225 crores when we came to office, it's 13,325 mm. crores now. So industry looks forward to capital expenditure, both in human capital, social infrastructure, sure. and physical infrastructure. Sure. Now all this is the backdrop to the fact that companies after companies are now expanding. Mm. I'll give you two quick examples. Mm. TCS, Data Consulting Service, it has got 40 acres of land on which they are building for 20,000 additional IT professionals. Okay. Now you take, go to manufacturing. Uh, Tata Metallics, mm. which is located in one of our parts, is, has just asked us a few weeks ago for another 300 acres in the park, okay. our own park, mm. for expansion. Now you take the case of Anil Ambani's group, uh, 600 crores investment in a cement plant. Mm. Uh, um, uh, Imami, another cement plant. You've given us several instances of companies that are yes. now either hiking their plans yes. in yes. West Bengal or putting in fresh investment. Is there yes. a number over the last four years of what you've been able to Absolutely. draw in? Absolutely, there's a number and I've said it on the floor of the assembly which means I can be eligible for privilege motion if I don't say rightly. Till last month, the total since we came to office is 87,000 crores, okay. which is either completed or in the process of com completion. Mm. So the examples I've given you are only indications of this 84,000 crores and by 87,000 crores. By the way, this is only medium and large industry. Okay. I'll give an example from small industry. We may have had as many as 52,000 additional small and medium en uh, enterprises over the last four years. Our number of clusters have hmm. grown from 48 to over 300. Okay. They are very labor intensive. Okay. Creates many more jobs. What more can we expect, for instance, as far as labor reforms are concerned? Yes. Uh, land is not an issue. As per your government, uh, you believe that you have 4,500 acres that is available with physical infrastructure for the taking if private sector wants it. Uh, what can we expect, at least on issues like land, labor, and so on and so forth? I think what is interesting is, as far as land is concerned, you have said 4,500 crores, which is in our own parks, ready to go. But in addition, we have a lakh acres, mm. 100,000 acres, with different departments of the government, which can be availed for industry. For example, just now, the Animal Husbandry Department has given over 300 acres to the Industry Department, West Bengal Industrial Development Corporation, mm. to develop an industrial park. So the land bank, as Mamta Banerjee has repeatedly said, consists of one lakh acres, okay. along with, of course, the developed infrastructure land, which is 4,400 plus another 4,000 under infrastructure construction. Hmm. So as far as land is concerned, this is a red herring. In West Bengal, there is no problem with land. Okay. Whoever has asked for land has got it immediately. Hmm. Now the second question is, which you've asked, how are we going to improve ourselves further? There's no end to improvement. We should be world class. We should be competitive. You'll be happy to know that in a month, or month and a half or so, you will see something which I'd like to keep as a mystery. Give us some sense of what we can expect. Well, you know, the, the issue is that electronically doing ease of business. Mm. Uh, I think your viewers would like to understand that when somebody applies to the industry ministry, 
clearances essentially come from non industry that's right so you have the environment ministry you have irrigation you have fire you have all kinds of uh, uh, departments power for example mm. you have to provide mm. power mm. water mm. you have to provide all these clearances come from other departments yeah let me now talk to you about the focus areas and you've put together a bunch of sectors that the government believes it wants to attract investment into urban infrastructure and housing food processing horticulture msme and textiles it uh, you want to do a gift city equivalent i believe in uh, in uh, west bengal as well and convert west bengal into a financial services hub hospitality energy and infrastructure healthcare and education manufacturing don't you believe that by trying to spread yourself across all of this you may not really be able to do justice would you not like to identify one or two key areas which then become the usp uh, which become really in that sense the brand as far as the state of west bengal is concerned because you're late in the race when it comes to manufacturing you're late in the race when it comes to financial services you're late in the race when it comes to it services i think that's a very good question indeed let me submit to you let me give you one or two of the flavor of this whole range mm. first we have just announced six townships mm. entirely on government land okay each township has a theme you want to do education and health you go to siliguri beautiful land uh, at the foothills of, uh, of of the himalayas you build 25% of your township on the theme of health and education okay 25% on low low cost housing mm. and the 50% you build malls you build uh, housing whatever you want sometimes you may want to cross subsidize some of that mm. similarly shantiniketan the center of mm. the kobi kobi guru romindra tego what are we doing there what is the theme culture okay. art and culture mm. we were in uh, delhi doing the uh, promotional work for the next uh, global bengal business summit uh, bengal global business summit to take place in january interesting the american companies with whom we met as a part of amcham mm. they all offered to help in townships why cisco said look we have technology you can mm. use with uh, with uh, 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 practice you know part of the yeah, united yeah. technologies yeah. they said we have township technology which will be digitalizing your mm. process pm mm. came up and said we'll do something mm. so what i'm saying to you is these are not only intelligent and smart but they are green Ra new town rajarhat which is emerging people say that you know right inside the rajarhat we have a financial hub mm. do you know that 19 banks have paid the money so money is uh, you put your money where the mouth is mm. and have taken land in our financial hub 19 banks of india so this is a usp that after mumbai mm. which is obviously the financial capital of india mm. kolkata is going to some day pip mumbai by building this financial hub. you know when you're talking about creating uh, west bengal as a financial services hub hospitality hub textile hub and so on and so forth what is this going to translate into as far as job creation is concerned the battle of bengal is in 2016 this is going to be an issue that i'm sure that your government is going to talk about uh, your government would want to claim uh, ownership as far as this issue is concerned what will this actually translate into as far as job creation is concerned and also as far as the state's gdp is concerned your claim is that you will double the state's gdp uh, over the next 5 years yes i think the most important part of all this is ours is a people oriented government we are pro poor let me make it clear but that means we are complementary to being pro business hmm. people see contradictions in that that's foolish so our idea is whatever you do has to create jobs Amit Mitra Das Singh more than 80,000 crore rupees have been committed into the state over the last 4 years telling us how the state has transformed what else we can expect with that it's time for us to say goodbye thanks for watching in the business hour